Hi, I'm Martin Pritikin, the Dean of Concord Law School at Purdue University Global, the nation's first fully online law school. Welcome to this latest installment in our Distinguished Speaker webinar series titled Health Law and Policy, A Congressman's Perspective. Now I'm delighted that our featured guest today is going to be Congressman Roger Krishnamurthy, who has represented the 8th District of Illinois in the U.S. House of Representatives since 2016, and who serves, among other things, on the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis, and so is well qualified to talk on today's topic. A child of immigrants who went on to graduate from Princeton University and Harvard Law School, Congressman Christian Murthy has had a long and distinguished career in business as well as in state and federal government, including prior to entering Congress with the Illinois Housing Development Authority as Special Assistant Attorney General and as Deputy State Treasurer. And there are, however, some drawbacks about having a speaker who's so active at the highest levels of government. And one of those drawbacks is that their schedules can be quite fluid and unpredictable. You see, another one of the committees that Congressman Christian Murthy serves on is the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And due to an important intelligence briefing, which I can only surmise has to do with the war on Ukraine, um, he's a bit delayed and is going to be joining us at about 1250 Eastern time. Nevertheless, we are fortunate to have an in-house expert on the Concord Law School faculty, Professor Scott Johnson, who has designed and taught a number of health law classes at Concord. And so Professor Johnson is going to join us and lay some important foundation about health law before Congressman Christian Murthy excuse me, uh, joins us in just a bit. So uh, Professor Johnson, thank you for uh, joining us last minute. I appreciate uh, you willing to accommodate us. Thank you, Marty. Glad to be here. Um, I also wanted to state, uh, so for those of you who are watching this uh, on Facebook Live, um, feel free to post questions or comments in the chat box, and uh, we will, to the extent we can, try and incorporate some of those questions uh, with the interview with the speakers um, as we go uh, through the, uh, the webinar. Okay, so Professor Johnson, uh, I want to start off with some basics, right? And we may have folks in the audience who are experts, people who may not be familiar with health law or even with law at all. So let's just lay some groundwork. Because I think I might get, you know, a little unsure sometimes. What do we mean when we say health law? Does, that, does it just mean law concerning doctors and hospitals? Is it broader than that? What does the term actually refer to? I think laws governing doctors and hospitals or health care would be kind of the starting point. And that in itself is very broad because it includes not just interactions with patients, but the interactions that determine what those entities, healthcare providers and hospitals, other institutions can do and can't do. And then with the doctor-patient relationship, a lot of areas that we're all familiar with, confidentiality, uh, informed consent, malpractice, and coverage, access to care, uh, medical devices and drugs. There's just a wide range of laws that apply to all of those healthcare issues. But then there's also public health, health and safety and those issues tend to be a little broader. So public health has been very much in the news and in our lives the past few years with COVID. There's a lot of other public health issues out there, you know, smoking, uh, other types of contagious diseases are all issues that public health laws have addressed for years. And that can include safety issues as well, health and safety in the workplace and housing, environmental issues like clean air and clean water. You can have a kind of a large umbrella of all of that if you want to incorporate it. Well, uh, that certainly does sort of cover the gamut. And uh, right, obviously, uh, many of us who didn't really think about uh, public health as an issue prior to a couple of years ago, none of us have been able to ignore it given the coronavirus pandemic. Um, let me ask you another foundational question before we start getting into topics like COVID. So what are the different sources of health law um, at federal, state, local levels, or you know, congressional or, or otherwise? What are we talking about when we're talking about sources of health law? It really runs the gamut there, too. Every level of government, federal, state, and local, has some role in some aspect of health law, particularly in public health, but in other areas as well. Sometimes one level of government's more involved than the other. Uh, the FDA, for example, is the entity that deals with medical drugs and devices in terms of prescription drugs. States don't really get involved as much with that, but they're involved with the practice of medicine issues. But each level has some involvement, and there's sources from each source. The Constitution can be involved at the federal and state level. Legislatures can be involved passing statutes and agencies 
are involved passing regulations and issuing guidance. And we've seen lots of that, you know, over the past few years at each level, really. So let's use a concrete example. Let's talk about COVID, right? Because that's all I've been talking about for the last two years. Um, so walk me through what COVID regulations or rules there might be at different levels, both at the federal level and state and local. I'm, for example, in Los Angeles, right? So, you know, we might have different local rules than uh, another city in California or certainly another state. So walk me through what those different levels of, of regulation would be regarding, you know, COVID, masks, vaccines, whatever the case may be. Sure. And those two issues are, are ones that everybody's probably familiar with, and e- kind of easy to address. There are a lot of other laws in place that Congress has passed the statutes to deal with the impact of COVID, the economic impact, for example. But if we stick with kind of issues around businesses being open or closed, you know, quarantine, mask, vaccines, the way that kind of works is dependent on the source of authority and the levels that we just talked about. So for example, with vaccine mandates, we've seen the executive branch, the president have some vaccine mandates for federal employees, and then have a rule from OSHA for large employers, and then have a rule for uh, medical employees that were employed for institutions that that receive Medicaid or Medicare funds. And then those have certain impacts that we can talk more about. But then at the Uh, agency level, you see agencies issue regulations or guidance or orders. The CDC is a good example. The CDC has some areas of control and some areas that it cannot control, and they're more in the state side. So with mask requirements, the CDC did issue an order regarding mask requirements for public transportation, like airports. But when it gets into other areas, they don't have the jurisdiction to do that. So that falls onto the states. So then the CDC will issue guidance to help states. States also have their own health departments that look at that guidance, develop their own guidance, and then the states can determine what they want to do and how they want to do it. During the initial part of the pandemic, some governors took actions to close down certain businesses and require certain requirements, and that was under their executive powers. Sometimes legislatures passed laws to address that, and sometimes agencies issued orders or issued guidance. So for Los Angeles, for example, you'd have you know, local agencies that were involved with that. And then at the state level, you would have uh, either governmental orders or statutes or regulations or guidance that the local communities would have to abide by and act consistently with. Different states have dealt with that different ways. Some states have left more to local communities. Some states have been more at the state level, either allowing it or prohibiting it in some ways for mask mandates in particular. So really, if someone wanted to know, you know, do I have to wear a mask? Do I have to get vaccinated? Can I require, you know, my employees or whatever to to wear a mask? They'd have to look at multiple layers of federal, state, and possibly local rules to figure out what they can do, must do, or can't do. Is that is that right? Right. And at sort of the initial level, it's just looking to see what the local community has said, what your town or city has said, if anything about it what your state has said about it in terms of the requirements. Those have recently changed in some areas because the CDC just issued some new guidelines about recommendation for masks in particular. But that's the first step is what does the community say, the town level, city level, what does the state say? And um, usually those are based in some ways on guidance from the CDC or some other agency, depending on the issue for COVID. So, uh, I guess it's advisory that people, you know, localities follow the CDC, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, I just heard yesterday, I don't know if you saw this headline, that apparently uh, the, um, the chief doctor, I forget his title, I don't know if he's the Surgeon General uh, of Florida, was actually recommending that healthy kids ages 5 to 11 not get vaccinated uh, against CDC guidelines. And I, I guess, at least within the state of Florida, he's within his jurisdiction to do that. Is that right? Right. So that's a good example of of guidelines being guidelines as opposed to mandatory. So the the CDC has issued guidelines that uh, and the FDA is involved with the vaccination approval of the vaccine. So those two agencies have kind of been the the main federal agencies involved with those issues and putting out information that states and local communities can use or not use regarding policies that they develop, laws that they develop. And you've seen some states uh, enact 
things that are kind of in step with what the CDC has recommended and others do not always do that. States have their own sort of inherent police authority to make decisions around health and safety as well. The federal government can do that in some respects too in certain situations. Um, and it just kind of varies on the situation, whether they have the authority to sort of override or issue a mandatory order for something. They can do and, it more clearly when it's like travel or commerce or something along those lines. When it's within a state, it's a little um, less clear. And just to clarify, because I think police authority is a, is a term of art in law, right? It doesn't mean necessarily, you know, uniformed law enforcement officers. You're talking about a state's general authority to you know, look out for the, the health and welfare of its citizens, right? Police authority might include things like schools and you know, things like, is that, is, that, is that a fair uh, characterization? Yeah, very fair. Thanks for following up. That's right. It doesn't mean policing in that sense. It's, it's more around the safety and health and safety of its citizens. The federal government doesn't have that kind of general power. It's more a government of limited powers States do have those kind of general powers, so that's why you'll see states generally take the lead on the issues we've been talking about, unless it involves something that's interstate or with travel, commerce, something along those lines. That's why the CDC, for example, did a mandatory order for airports and public transportation for masks, but then just did guidance for other areas that states could use or not and make those determinations. Well, so speaking about those state versus federal issues, let's talk about uh, the two recent Supreme Court decisions on the vaccine mandates. You mentioned that there was OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, if I got that right. Um, That was one of them. There was another one. I believe the Supreme Court upheld one, but struck down the other. And can you explain what those rulings were and why the Supreme Court would have ruled differently on, on two seemingly similar mandates? Yes, it all goes back to the the source of authority and how the federal government is created. There's agencies that can do whatever they're allowed to do under statute. So they're created by statute and the authority that they have is limited by statute and certain actions can exceed that authority. And that's essentially what happened in those cases. The OSHA case, the court ruled that the existing statutes that were in place did not give OSHA the authority to enact that particular regulation. And part of it was because of um, the enormity of it, how important it was on workers and society. The court said that they expect Congress to act on matters like that. If it's not clear enough, then that's something that Congress should do rather than an agency interpreting the law that way based on what existed. By contrast with the other case, which dealt with institutions that receive Medicare and Medicaid fund, the requirement came about as a condition. So the federal government can say to states, hey, if you want some of our funds, we'll provide them to you, but there's certain conditions that you have to meet in order to receive the funding. Medicaid is one of those types of programs. They included a condition under Medicaid that the workers or employees that worked at an institution that received funding get vaccinated. And based on the statutes that existed and the authority the agency had, the court said that was permissible. And uh, I assume probably most every hospital and medical care facility in the country accepts some funds for Medicare and Medicaid patients and therefore it affected almost the entire healthcare sector. Is that, is that right? Quite a few, right? The overwhelming majority certainly do. And yes, it did. Part of the issue there too was it was a much clearer connection to the court about health and safety, right? They're healthcare providers providing services to patients. And the idea there was that the language and the statutes that already existed was geared towards that. Patient safety do no harm to patients. So they didn't want to have doctors or healthcare providers that were themselves infected and the vaccine would help them not be infected. Whereas with health, and safety in the workplace, it's a little broader and didn't have some of that same language about particular health issues. And so that was part of the distinction between the two cases. Yeah, I, I believe uh, Supreme Court opinion said something to the effect of, you know, uh, COVID is a public health threat, but it's um, not something that's unique to the workforce, the workplace, right? So right. You know, if OSHA is supposed to be focusing on workplace safety, um, then, you know, you can't just sort of backdoor in uh, this regulation by saying, well, people face this threat in the workplace because people face this threat everywhere. 
right? Whereas right. the the medical care one, there was more of a, I guess, a close nexus. Um, right. That's exactly right. And it was just some broad language that OSHA can use to address worker safety, essentially, that the agency was looking at. And so it's more just the language that was there and the authority the agency has and doesn't have. Right. Um, now, I'm another question because, you know, most people probably aren't familiar with most health uh, related laws, but one that they probably have heard of is HIPAA. Right. Um, and I know, for example, uh, you know, certain celebrities have been reluctant to disclose their vaccination status. And some people have, you know, asserted they, they have a legal right not to disclose it, um, you know, setting aside the celebrities for a moment. Uh, what does HIPAA say as to whether uh, an employer or uh, another entity can inquire about your vaccination status? HIPAA does give some protection for medical information. Uh, personal health information is protected. Um, but HIPAA applies to covered entities, which is healthcare providers, uh, healthcare plans like health insurance and healthcare clearinghouses, which generally is not an employer. So, for example, it would violate HIPAA for a healthcare provider, a doctor, to disclose somebody's vaccination status without the approval or consent of the patient. But it wouldn't, would not violate HIPAA for an employer to ask an employee if they've been vaccinated. There can be some issues if you get into the why you're not vaccinated that can raise other issues around uh, disability, perhaps, or religious objections. But just in terms of the health part of it, it doesn't apply to employers in that way. Let's see. Um, and uh, I was also going to ask, even though it's not quite as much in the news these days, but that's sort of the point. Um, the other health law that I think most people are probably familiar with besides HIPAA is the Affordable Care Act. Right. This is the, the formal name for what was commonly referred to as Obamacare. Yep. Um, I know that shortly after it was passed and for you know, a number of years thereafter, there were a number of legal challenges to the validity of the Affordable Care Act or to certain portions of it. Um, I haven't heard as much about it lately. And I don't know if that's because the challenges have ended or if it's just not as big of news these days. But I don't know if you can tell us what is the, the current status of the Affordable Care Act and of the, the challenges to it? The law is still there, still alive and kicking. Uh, the latest challenge was decided by the Supreme Court on what's called standing ground. So they didn't get to the merits of the case. They addressed whether the plaintiffs had the ability to bring the case under the Constitution claims that they were bringing. And since that, it's died down a little. There's probably still some underlying you know, lower court cases here or there, it definitely has had a number of cases regarding uh, those issues, in particular, what's referred to as the individual mandate, the penalty, if you did not obtain health insurance is what a lot of the claims were over. And um, right now that penalty is, you know, been zeroed out because it was going to be a tax penalty and it's no longer a penalty. So the issue in that case was, should the law still be allowed to exist if the penalty is really not a penalty anymore. Uh, the court did not address that. Whether it will come back around with other plaintiffs trying to get the court to address it, I don't know. I know the current administration has plans to continue on with ACA. I've seen, read that in the news and, and do various things to try to improve upon it and continue on for coverage and access to care, which is very much a part of health law. Thank you. Um, now, I see we have some questions uh, coming in from the audience. So one of the questions, actually going back for just a minute to the, to the uh, vaccine issue, there's a question, will there be vaccine passports? So if you put on your, uh, your, your crystal ball hat, um, what do you think about that? Is that uh, something that's likely to happen? It's a good question. I, I don't know. I, I guess part of the issue would be who, what agency would be in charge of doing that if there were vaccine passports, it would be TSA or, or some other agency that would be involved in checking them and trying to validate them in some way. You know, we have agencies now that do that for regular passports for international travel. I, I do not know that there's any plans to have that at the federal level right now or at any states that I've seen. Certainly I've seen uh, various businesses that require some proof of vaccine and states have various positions on whether you can do that or not, but have not seen it in the sense of travel like that. Thank you. Um, so, Professor Johnson, it looks like uh, Congressman Christian Worthy is just about able to join us. Um, so if you don't mind standing by, um, I may bring you back towards the end uh, to answer a few more questions. 
Um, but if Congressman uh, Krishnamurti is able to join us, we'd love to have him uh, share his video. Much for joining us. I know that uh, you're incredibly busy always, but particularly at this time. So I appreciate you taking time out of your day to uh, speak with us. Sure thing. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, thanks for accommodating my schedule. I, I've literally, I literally have four hours of uh, hearings and classified briefings about Ukraine as a member of the Intelligence Committee, and I just finished uh, the first half of that, and uh, I'm going into our bunker underneath the Capitol. It's called the Skiff. Uh, as soon as I finish, so thanks for accommodating me. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, and I want to make good use of your time so I could uh, spend many, many minutes introducing you and talk about your accolades. But I did a little bit at the beginning just to uh, maximize the time we have. So let me ask you, just as a, by way of introduction, how did you get into Congress? I mean, I know you got elected, right? But I mean, how did you get into politics? And I'm also interested particularly of how do you get on the various committees that you're a part of? You're part of the Coronavirus Crisis Subcommittee. You're on the Intelligence Committee. Is that something that it's based on interest or background? You have to lobby for that? Is it sort of a, it elections? How does that process work? Sure. Uh, well, maybe I'll talk about the politics part first or government. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my backstory. I was actually born in India uh, and came to this country when I was about three months old. And things were going really well until suddenly they did not in the recession of 1973. And my family kind of hit the economic skids. Uh, but thanks to the generosity of the American people, uh, we were allowed to move into public housing and food stamps. And so I spent about half of my early childhood in those two programs. And thanks to the generosity of the American people, we were allowed to stay until my father could complete his studies and, and find an excellent job in, of all places, Peoria, Illinois. And so they loaded up the U-Haul truck and started driving and driving until they reached Peoria. But that's really where the golden period of my life or our lives began. And pretty much every night at the dinner table, my father would say something along the lines of, think of the greatness of this country. And whatever the two of you do, my brother and me, just make sure this country is there for the next families who need it. And so that became the North Star of my personal compass and fast forward through law school and um, uh, being a partner at, a, at a, a law firm called Kirkland and Ellis in Chicago, and then going into public service and starting helping to start the anti-corruption unit of the Illinois Attorney General's office, and then running a small business, I um, decided I would throw my uh, hat in the ring for Congress in 2015, and I got elected in 2016. And so my life has come full circle where I can pursue that mission statement that my parents assigned to me, which is just to make sure this country is there for the next families who need it. And so uh, here I am. Uh, I'm in my sixth year and third term. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to fulfill that mission statement that I think, you know, I, that's my purpose in life. And as for how to get on committees, um, it's pretty much all of the above uh, with regard to everything that you said. It's um, expressing your interest. It is advocating for, you know, why you should be on that committee. And then uh, it's ultimately up to the speaker to decide um, how she wants to, um, you know, up designate different people for different committees. And, uh, and so I'm so honored to be a member of the Intelligence Committee, as well as the uh, Special, Special Select Committee on COVID, as well as chair of the Oversight Subcommittee on Economic and Consumer Policy. And I can talk about any of that in more detail, too. Well, thank you so much. And that's an amazing background. Um, let's talk about COVID. Obviously, it's been on everyone's mind for the last uh, you know, two years. It seems, hopefully, that things are starting to subside, although, unfortunately, there's still many people dying each day. Uh, there's still a lot of open questions about vaccines and masks. Where do things stand right now with Congress? Um, and I realize that you know legislation related to COVID could cover a wide array of things, everything from economic stimulus to you know things more specifically targeted to uh, you know the healthcare industry. Um, what's the sense of where things stand with that, and where things are, are likely to go? Do you have any sense on that? 
Well, I think that, you know, first of all, uh, uh, we can breathe a, a sigh of relief that Omicron has declined in terms of its uh, spread and the number of cases. What I'm concerned about, uh, quite frankly, Dean, is I'm, I'm worried about the next variant. Um, and so where do we go from here? I think that where we have to go is we have to go abroad and get everyone vaccinated abroad. I, I, I believe that so strongly that I've pushed very hard uh, on the leadership of both parties to invest in making sure that, for instance, the 3.5 billion people who remain not fully vaccinated uh, get vaccinated. And the American people uh, favor this. Uh, polling repeatedly shows this. And for a modest investment, we can do the right thing and the smart thing, because if we don't, let's just take Africa, for example. 84% uh, of the continent has not received even one shot of the vaccine. So the vast, vast majority of the 1.2 billion people in Africa remain unvaccinated and another variant can develop there and then make its way here very quickly. It could be more lethal than Omicron. It could uh, spread even faster than Omicron and it would certainly disrupt our economy and our health. And so I am pushing very hard to lead a, for America to lead a global vaccination campaign. And I've introduced legislation regarding the same, and I'm hoping it gets included in the omnibus legislation that, they're, that we're voting on this week. Now, it raises a really important point that American health is often very tied in with world health. Um, how receptive have other countries been uh, with regard to this effort? And is it something that America could do alone or do we really need to get uh, many other countries on board to make a, a real impact on global vaccination rates? Well, I think that um, we should certainly work with all those who are willing to assist either with uh, monetary resources or with their know-how um, or with um, other uh, items that we need to actually carry out this global vaccination campaign. But if people don't step up around the world, we're going to have to do this. It is, it's in our national best interest. It's part of our national security. Think of the number of times now where we thought that COVID was going away only to see it come back, come roaring back in some instances, and then lead to all kinds of problems for our health and, of course, our economy so let's not rely on others, although others are willing and, and have expressed a desire to work with us. We're going to have to take the initiative and get this done. And uh, so I guess speaking of uh, initiative, um, you know, the, the Biden administration um, had uh, or different agencies had passed rules, right, requiring um, vaccinations for employers of over 100 employees, right, through OSHA. It was the other uh, mandate that applied uh, to healthcare workers, those treating Medicare, Medicaid patients. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts, you know, do you disagree with the Supreme Court ruling that struck down the OSHA mandate? Do you think that um, that's going to affect what type of uh, administrative regulations go forward? Um, what, what do you think the impact of that, that Supreme Court decision is? And, and, and do you agree with it? Well, I personally disagree with it, but obviously now it's the law of the land and so we have to comply. I'm glad that they uh, at least upheld the uh, mandates for uh, healthcare workers, which is extremely important. Uh, my wife happens to be one of them. She's an anesthesiologist at uh, the local hospital. And so she was intubating a lot of these COVID patients uh, uh -huh. on the front lines. And so uh, because of that, um, I think that the vaccine, I, I got an up close personal view of the importance of everyone getting vaccinated in a healthcare setting. I think going forward, there, I think our vaccination rate will continue to climb, although maybe not at the rate that it did before. Um, but most likely, uh, you know, we're going to also have to uh, think about boosters if if the if the pandemic persists and new variants develop. Um, but as I said, there are ways to deal with this, um, and we we need to take those 
opportunities to, for instance, get the rest of the world vaccinated, increase our vaccination rate, continue to be safe and develop anti-retroviral anti, uh, uh, drugs to um, uh, slow uh, uh, the development of COVID as a severe ailment if someone does suffer it and so forth. Um, so just so you know, we actually have questions coming in from the audience as we speak. And obviously we're, you know, getting a lot of questions about vaccines. Um, one question going back to the issue about uh, global vaccination. So if there are countries that have low vaccination rates, um, is limiting travel uh, from those countries to the U.S. something that we should be considering as a, uh, you know, prophylactic measure? Well, as you know, when, when a different country um, uh, develops uh, a contagion or a spread of, a, of COVID or any uh, particular ailment, contagious disease, um, we then evaluate you know, uh, whether or not we should cut off travel. And in the balance, we, I think, weigh a couple uh, different factors. One being, how does it affect our health? How does it affect our economy? How does it affect the economy of the country that we're cutting off travel from? Remember, at the end of the day, we have to protect ourselves and we have to cut off travel. At the same time, we don't want to create too many disincentives for countries, whether it's South Africa or other countries, from actually reporting or disclosing the existence of the virus. In South Africa's case, they did a, an excellent job of sharing the science and um, explaining what was going on and being very transparent with the world uh, about what was going on, uh, only to be met with a raft of um, travel bans from South Africa, uh, which, as you know, is, uh, has a significant impact on South Africa for various reasons. Um, and so we, we absolutely have to do these travel bans, but at the same time, we have to look at how to do them smartly and how to work with other countries and, and making sure that we don't do so much damage that uh, perhaps we don't learn about the next contagion that's, until it's too late. And I think that's another really important illustration of the idea that, you know, these problems are so complex, right? They involve not just health issues, economic issues, and incentives, right? Um, that sometimes you think, well, why don't we just draw a bright line in the sand and do this? But then you have to think about the you know, unintended consequences of that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons why we've, we've struggled uh, globally uh, to, to deal with this in many ways. Um, well, uh, there's still a lot of questions coming in on vaccines, but uh, I do want to cover at least a few other topics as long as we have you. Um, I know you were also instrumental uh, in uh, sponsoring legislation regarding vaping, right, e-cigarettes. Um, how did you get involved in that? I mean, that doesn't seem like uh, in your, you know, no direct background in that. How did that become an issue that you became a champion of in Congress? It's very simple. I have a 16-year-old at home. We have three kids, a 16, 12, and 5. And what I was hearing from my 16 and 12-year-old were, um, somewhat horrifying in terms of the spread of vaping within their schools. Um, just so you know, uh, or your audience knows, 20 to 25 percent of high school students now vape, and I believe it's now 5 to 10 percent of middle schoolers vape. And this is deeply disturbing because vaping is very, very harmful to children uh, with developing pulmonary systems and neurological functions. So I took on this issue. Uh, we conducted our first hearing on it with regard to Juul in, I think, 2019, the summer of 2019. And um, that caused a big stir because we exposed Juul's direct marketing campaigns to youth. And, uh, and, and after that, the Trump administration uh, enacted a partial flavor ban, um, as well as uh, Juul ending all domestic marketing campaigns. Um, and then we went after Puff Bar, uh, which is a disposable e-cigarette company because it violated various rules and regulations. Um, and we were able to shut it down temporarily. And it came back with a vengeance 
in the form of synthetic nicotine uh, disposable e-cigarettes. Um, and so now I'm trying to close the synthetic nicotine loophole uh, so that FDA has full authority to regulate this type of nicotine as well. And I'm very hopeful we can get that done soon. But the main point is it started with my personal experience and my children. And, uh, and then it proceeded to joining hands with a lot of other advocates who felt the same. Now, I don't know if you have involvement in this, but you mentioned this idea of synthetic nicotine. And I guess the idea, right, is that if the FDA regulates tobacco products, which contain nicotine, that if it's entirely synthetic, I guess it's not technically a tobacco product. Is that the, is that the issue? That's uh, part of the argument that uh, some of these uh, uh, synthetic nicotine companies are making and puff bars making, which is that uh, they believe, and again, I, I believe that they're wrong, their argument is that somehow synthetic nicotine is not covered within the Tobacco Control Act, the TCA. And, um, and so uh, just to be crystal clear about this, um, I have legislation to remove any ambiguity whatsoever that actually FDA does have the uh, authority to regulate any form of nicotine, whether it's tobacco derived or synthetic, um, and uh, I want to close that loophole right away. That sounds uh, great to me. Um, I read in a article from Time from 2020, you were quoted about this and you were fairly critical of the FDA's early response um, to e-cigarettes and vaping, um, saying they were, quote, kind of AWOL on the issue. Um, do you feel that the FDA has gotten it together on this issue or are you still critical of, of their handling of this? I think it's improved, but um, I still think that they need to hustle because uh, you know we have a whole generation of kids that are getting hooked to vape, vaping. And what I've, what I've understood from the scientists and health experts is that vaping ends up being a gateway to other uh, even more addictive products. And so uh, what I have said to the FDA is let's close the loopholes within the partial flavor ban, meaning uh, we should not allow for any flavors to exist, whether it's menthol or any other flavor. And by the way, today you can have menthol vapes under uh, the partial flavor ban. And then the second thing I said is uh, we have to get rid of these um, uh, very high concentration nicotine products. Um, it's one thing to have uh, e-cigarettes with maybe some low level amount of nicotine to help adults uh, perhaps transition off smoking if that's uh, truly necessary. But the nicotine load is so high in your average e-cigarette that it ends up addicting children very quickly. And so um, we're trying to get the FDA to also move on that so they have some work to do. I just spoke with the new commissioner, Mr. Califf, Commissioner Califf, about this particular issue last week. And I believe that, um, I believe they're gonna take action. He seems committed to this and I'm gonna hold them to it. Well, that's great. Um, well, I, I appreciate that. Um, a related topic somewhat, and that it involves uh, FDA oversight is uh, the opioid crisis. Um, and obviously Purdue Pharma, I should state no relation to Purdue University, but, uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes people get that confused. Um, so, uh, you were very much against the prior bankruptcy plan that would have immunized the Sackler family from, uh, future civil litigation. Is that right? That's right. I thought that that was a, uh, a travesty of justice. I think it, it basically, um, uh, allowed a party that has not declared bankruptcy to enjoy the protections of bankruptcy through what's called a non-consensual debtor release. I'm sorry, non-consensual non-debtor release. And um, that's just a fancy way of saying that uh, essentially uh, the Sackler family, which did not declare bankruptcy, uh, tried to get a bankruptcy court to prevent anybody, any party, any third party from being able to sue them in connection with their activities with Purdue Pharma, 
even though uh, those third parties uh, are not suing the estate, but they're suing the Sacklers directly. So this is a really, um, to me, a very uh, bad use of the bankruptcy code. And uh, I, a lot of people agree with me. Now, recently, there was a, a, a new proposal, um, a, a settlement that was agreed to amongst more states that had held out previously. Um, the prior bankruptcy plan uh, was rejected by the bankruptcy court. Uh, this one hasn't yet been ruled on. It involves more money being kicked in by the Sackler family members. I believe it's $6 billion instead of $4.8 billion, but I believe it still involves uh, a release of civil liability. Uh, so is this something you would still oppose or does the fact that the Sackler family is kicking in more money, they're giving an apology, um, certain other concessions they're making, does that make it more palatable to you or do you, would you still oppose uh, this new settlement? It's a good question. I have to look at it more closely. I haven't had a chance to, uh, you know, review the terms very closely, but I do have legislation that, uh, you know, prevents the abuse of the bankruptcy code in the way that the Sacklers intended. And um, I'm going to continue to pursue that because I think that if you allow for this type of practice to exist, it'll just mushroom acro across the landscape in any number of uh, permutations. Um, there are certain instances where a bankruptcy court needs to um, uh, create releases uh, against the estate for sure. Um, and I can see a situation where there could be consensual releases uh, where uh, a family or an entity poured a lot of money into the estate so that third parties could collect against that estate. Um, but it needs to be consensual in that case. And um, I, I just, and also where the government has claims. Uh, that's a big red flag that, hey, a lot of people don't consent to what's happening here. When states right. are filing claims, that's a big red flag to the bankrupt bankruptcy court that, you know, it's it's like, okay, the, it's one thing to enjoin, you know, maybe some individuals or entities you can't connect with or you don't, you can't identify them or they're too dispersed. But in this case, you know exactly which states have claims. And if they say, no, I don't consent, you can't just override that, which is what the court tried to do. Right, right. Um, now, one of the things that even the, the revised plan, to my understanding, doesn't um, preclude is possible criminal prosecution for Sackler family members. Is that something that you think is realistic coming down the pike? Or do you think that's... Uh, you know, too much of a, of a stretch to be able to, to prove that. I don't know if you have any information on that. Um, I don't know all the evidence that prosecutors have in their possession about the Sacklers. My guess, my educated guess about this is that they want to preserve the option uh, to go after the Sacklers, especially if they discover additional evidence or if uh, there were false statements made or what have you. Um, but I, I think just overall, there's just a sense here in Congress that the Sacklers, uh, when they appeared before us, they appeared before the oversight hearing. And um, I'll just give you an example of an exchange that I had with one of the Sacklers. You know, basically uh, the Sacklers knew exactly what was going on with the, uh, the rate of addictions with OxyContin. They knew that their revenues were pouring in, their profits were pouring in. Uh, they used those gains to purchase assets left and right. And um, it's clear to me that they just didn't care uh, what the consequences of their activities were because they became dependent on the money. Mm -hmm. And so I said to uh, one of them, after I showed him a picture of a couple mansions that he purchased with the money, and I asked him, is this your mansion, sir? And he says, I didn't sleep even one night in that mansion. That's that house. That's owned by my trust. Um, and, and I was like, oh, yes, that's owned by your trust. I get it. Yes. 
Um, and then I basically ended by saying, look, you know, the consumers of your items were addicted to OxyContin, but I respectfully submit that you are addicted to money and uh, you don't get it. And, and, and I think that's the, that's the sentiment around here about the Sacklers. Well, and it seems like that that's something there might be, you know, bipartisan support for. In other words, bipartisan support for the vaping bill. Um, one question from the audience, has there been any progress in Congress on drug price controls? I know that's been a, a big issue, um, particularly for, for elderly um, citizens. Uh, I don't know if that's something that, that Congress can control directly. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to, to add on, on that front. Yes, uh, Congress um, has been negotiating a prescription drug pricing program on a bipartisan, well, I'm not sure if it was bipartisan. It was definitely uh, something that uh, we were thinking about doing on a reconciliation basis, meaning with Democrats only. And I think that we came to an agreement uh, on this particular issue. I'd like to see it move forward um, because as you know, there's some life-saving drugs such as insulin, which have skyrocketed in price, even though there has been zero innovation in insulin in, in, in the actual formulation of insulin in decades. And so that seems to be a, a situation where we absolutely have to make insulin affordable and accessible, even if it means that the drug companies don't make the billions and billions in profits that they otherwise were used to with regard to insulin. Well, thank you for that. Um, well, speaking of uh, access, uh, we haven't shied away from controversial topics, uh, so why, why stop now? Um, <laughs> so uh, let's talk about abortion for just a couple of minutes. Um, you know, obviously uh, there was the Texas law that in many ways effectively um, abrogated uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, the Supreme Court declined to overturn it, um, at least at this point, and given the composition of the court, it seems unlikely uh, that they would do so. What do you see for the future of Roe v. Wade uh, with this court? I would say it's uncertain at best. I don't know how the court is going to treat Roe v. Wade at this point. Um, the fact that they were not willing to enjoin the state of Texas from, you know, basically putting this very questionable law with a very questionable enforcement mechanism uh, in place, pending the litigation that was about to happen or that is continuing to happen, means that they basically ignored even the precedential effect of Roe v. Roe v. Wade. So I think at this point, uh, I'm very concerned about how they're going to treat Roe v. Wade. I think a lot of states like Illinois and others uh, have already adopted mechanisms that spring into place if uh, the Supreme Court decides to overturn uh, Roe. But uh, I personally think that this is one of those issues that um, I, you know, I hear a lot about this for my constituents, especially women. Uh, and um, if it does get if it does get overturned, uh, watch out. There's going to be a tidal wave of um, outrage from women who view Roe rightfully as integral to their uh, to their personal. Uh, to their personhood and to their independence and to them being uh, treated as an equal gender. Well, thank you. Um, and it will certainly be interesting to see uh, what happens with that. Um, Congressman, I know you actually are going to have to leave very quickly. Um, any last comments? Are there uh, any uh, points you'd like to raise or, uh, you know, sort of closing message you'd like folks to know? Um, about healthcare issues facing America today, Congress's role, or your personal thoughts? Well, I think, first of all, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks Thank for, for coming. my schedule. I have to run into the, the SCIF uh, to meet with the CIA of all, of all people. Um, but I think that uh, with regard to health 
I please ask you to stand with me in advocating for global public health, especially with global vaccinations. This is so important. It's important for us. It's important for them. It's the right thing to do, and it's the smart thing to do. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And again, uh, thank you for taking your time out of your day. I know you have very important things going on. I appreciate it, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Just heard from Congressman Christian Murphy. Um, tried to cover the gamut in the in the in the time that we had. Um, I have some uh, follow up questions. Uh, I'm going to ask some of them. I think are I won't ask because some of the audience questions are specifically about you know what people are you know what's going on in Congress, which I don't expect you to have the inside info on. Um, do you have any initial impressions about uh, what Congressman Christian Murphy said? Any uh, anything he said that surprised you, that you disagree with, that you you strongly agree with? Um, again, I have specific questions I can ask, but I'm just curious to get your initial thoughts, having heard what he had to say. Overall, just very interesting, and interesting how the issues that he's talked about, you know, are are not necessarily new. They build on a lot of what we just talked about, the vaping, for example, and the whole history with cigarettes. There's a whole backstory to that, and the agency's efforts to regulate things, and now. The puff bar, I think he said, trying to take advantage of the synthetic loophole, so to speak. There's a lot of details to that that I'm not sure the audience would be interested in. But all those kinds of things are very interesting to me in terms of the structure and how agencies work and how the Congress can play a role with that. And uh, as long with COVID and the vaccination, that would involve a little bit different than what we talked about in terms of our government. because It would be our government providing funds and resources to other entities to help with global vaccination, uh, probably WHO and UNICEF, those kinds of entities would be uh, who I assume we would fund to help them provide vaccinations in other countries, but all, all very interesting public health information. WHO being World Health Organization, right? Right, right. Yeah. Um, well, let's actually follow up. Uh, if you could give a little bit of backstory about the history of the efforts to regulate um, smoking, traditional cigarettes, and how that then led into the regulation of e-cigarettes. Sure. The uh, Congressman mentioned the Tobacco uh, Control Act. That came about, I think, 2009 or so, and was a result of efforts that the FDA had made in the 90s to regulate tobacco as a drug, nicotine as a drug, under the existing statutes. And that was challenged and went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said that the existing statutes and regulations did not permit the FDA to do that. So then a few years after that, the law was put into place, which did give the FDA the authority to do that. So they started regulating tobacco in various ways, distribution, marketing, uh, manufacturing of tobacco, and then vaping came along, e-cigarettes. So then the agency had to adapt to that, put in some regulations that included all that. And what the congressman saying is that those laws are based on tobacco. So nicotine derived from tobacco, I think, is the language or something along those lines. So now companies are making the nicotine not from tobacco and saying, oh, well, we don't fit within what you currently have as regulations. And his legislation would would close that. I guess there's some room to argue that it could be covered under the existing laws, but that goes back to what they had to deal with in the 90s of whether it is or not. So it's a little right. uh, uncertain. And so legislation would clarify it. Going back to our structure, the laws that agencies follow come from Congress and that gives them their authority. So as long as Congress has the authority to pass the law, then the agency would have the authority to implement regulations and enforce that law within its jurisdiction. And I don't know if it's coincidental or not, but I believe um, e-cigarettes came out on the market the very same year that the FDA had authority to regulate cigarettes, uh, tobacco products as a drug. So who knows about that? Um, so uh, jumping around a little bit, because I do want to try and get in a few more audience questions before we wrap up. Um, we were talking about OxyContin and the, and the Sackler family. And someone asked the question, does Congress have the power to remove OxyContin from uh, the list of approved drugs. I'm assuming that means approved for, for Medicare. I, I mean, could Congress just outlaw the sale of OxyContin altogether? Good question. There's a couple of different levels to that. So th there's an agency, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, that has to approve all prescription drugs. And so they approved OxyContin. The test there is basically that the good of the drug has to outweigh the harm, the benefits, and it has to be safe. 
And so part of the criticisms of the FDA that the congressman that you were asking about was that they uh, did always enforce that going forward with some of their marketing efforts and the warnings that had to be put out with the drug that would allow the drug to be used in situations that maybe it wasn't supposed to be used for originally for treating pain, situations that might not be as severe as the FDA had thought is what it would be used for. So there is a process in place for that and legislation to do that. So the FDA could take actions if they were if the FDA thought that the drug manufacturers were violating any of those requirements and that the evidence was showing that it wasn't as safe and effective as they thought it was when they passed it. That's one thing that could happen. The other thing is to answer the question directly, Congress probably does have the authority to enact legislation because the FDA is there because of the authority that Congress gave them originally to approve drugs and devices. So if they wanted to take some specific actions or change laws uh, that make it more difficult for that approval to continue as it was, uh, they probably could do something along those lines. And so I don't actually know the answer to this. I mean, is Congress the one who passes laws saying, you know, cocaine's illegal, heroin's illegal? Is that how it works? Or is that something that's sort of passed through through an agency? Right. So there would be some broad law, broad language and laws around those and there's schedules of drugs. And that's how it gets determined by the agency level for those uh, narcotics, uh, Schedule 4 drugs, call that would be the, the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, that addresses those kinds of issues and determines when something fits within the schedule to make it illegal or not. Uh, we've seen some of those issues, for example, with marijuana. You know, marijuana at the federal level is still considered illegal, but states are allowed in some respects to legalize that. You know, now for recreational purposes, a number of states have done that. But you can't use certain federal, you know, like uh, commerce to do that. I mean, some of the prohibitions on that are you're not allowed, if you're a dispensary is what it's called, to uh, use credit cards or something that would use the commerce system because at the federal level, it's still prohibited. So I guess maybe one last question. It's kind of a broad one, but I think it's an interesting one raised by the audience. There's a question about universal health care in the United States. Is this possible? Is the U.S. culturally compatible with it? I know other you know, Western democracies have adopted it, um, although they tend to you know, lean more towards a socialist model. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, there certainly have been a number of political candidates that have run on platforms that talk about universal care in the past few elections. The current president did not. He's more proposing uh, improving the ACA coverage provisions that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. So there have been specific proposals. You know, we do have a public program in Medicare and a state federal program in Medicaid that does provide care. So some of the proposals were to expand those uh, at some levels. I think the current administration wants to expand Medicaid a little by reducing the age, some of the age requirements. Um, but I don't think there's any current proposals right now, at least that are getting any traction to do a universal health care in the sense of a government funded universal health care plan. Not to say that couldn't change you know, going forward. Right. I mean, um, even the passage of, uh, you know, Medicare was a you know, kind of a huge undertaking. Um, people didn't think it would stick. And now it's just sort of sort of part of the, the bedrock of, you know, American society. Uh, I think the one thing we can say is we should never be surprised by our capacity to surprise ourselves. Um, well, Professor Johnson, again, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day um, to speak with us. Uh, your insights have been very valuable, um, both to lay the groundwork for some of these bedrock concepts of health law and also your insights on the Congressman's comments. Uh, I know he's left, but I also want to once again thank Congressman Christian Murphy for taking the time to speak with us uh, about these topics. Um, you know, as we saw, health law covers a lot of different areas that affect a lot of parts of so many people's lives. And even those of us who aren't in the healthcare industry, um, we can't avoid it. It affects, you know, travel, it affects the economy, it affects, you know, so many aspects of, of everyday life, not to mention when we actually do have a medical issue we need to deal with. These are important issues. I think it's important that all of us, all of you who are watching, whether you're a lawyer, a law student, thinking about going to law school, or if you have nothing to do with the law, um, these are important issues that we should take time to think about and learn about. I want to thank all of you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you at our next Distinguished Web Speaker webinar. So on behalf of all of us from Concord Law School at Purdue University Global, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thank you.